thank you for indulging me. Um, just to start this, we had a wonderful um, a group of talks from Dr. Kelly, uh, from Reverend Kelly Isola. Um, she was amazing about uh, pulling some things about Myrtle Fillmore's life into the front rather than her being in the background, which she often is in the background. She was she was kind of the thinker and the doer behind so many things. But Charles was the one that tended to stand up and 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 say right and talk. He wrote the more of the book. She only wrote a couple of them. But uh, I just thought it was a great insight, and I just so appreciated Kelly's uh, ability to tell us more about this amazing woman of the uh, 1870s and 1880s. So many things were happening then. Um, and it struck me that my friend Bob Proctor, and I can't see all of you right now because the screen is up and, and I only have a few faces here, but I don't know how many of you know Bob Proctor. M many people do, and if you want to just raise your hand and say you do, that's great. Um, know of his teachings. He's been around since the 1960s and 70s, as far as a motivational speaker, if you will, uh, had philosophies about stuff to to build on things that actually came from older um, descriptive stuff, which is a lot to do in balance with unity teachings. And as Kelly was doing her talks, I thought, oh, I kind of wanted to give a bit of a memorial to Bob. He passed away in, in February this year. And, uh, and it, I thought, oh my gosh, they have such similar lives. I think we can have a little talk about Bob and Myrtle. So what do they have in common? A lot of their teaching things, their thinking stuff, as they would call it, is very similar and they actually had some similar life journeys and similar personality traits. So we'll enjoy this together and thank you for indulging me with the time to spend with my friend, Bob. Bob was born in 1934 and he was born in actually Guelph, Ontario. I just found that out yesterday. I, thought, I know he was a Toronto guy, but I didn't know he was born in Guelph. His family moved to, uh, to Toronto in his early life and he actually grew up there. Myrtle, of course, was born about a hundred years earlier so she was in a different space. She had a, a very um, uh, uh, fairly strict Methodist upbringing, but she tended to, to, to move away from that as she started to think for herself. We know that Myrtle heard a lecture by E.B. Weeks that said we are all children of God and we do not have to help manifest anything from our past or take on anything from our you know, genetic DNA. Bob Proctor's opening to hearing a story, I'll tell you a little bit about Bob, is that uh, at a young age, he left school. He left school when he was about grade 10. He said, I'm kind of done with school. This is kind of silly. Uh, he claims to have never read a book. Um, I don't know if that was really true or not, but he claims to have never read a book. He became a firefighter in his late teens. And he often talks about the fact that being a firefighter was a great job. Unfortunately, he was making $4,000 and owed $6,000. And he always talked about the fact that money was a, an issue in his life because he didn't have a good mindset about it. And that's what changed a lot of his teachings over time. He also unfortunately fell in with a little bit of um, going out with the guys thing after work. And there was a lot of drinking that went on. And he found himself in the form of alcoholism at some point in his actually fairly young life. He had a young family, three children, um, you know, was, tr was trying to make ends meet. But unfortunately, alcohol sort of took over. And we know with Myrtle, she was always told as a child that she was sickly and she was ill and she had tuberculosis. And so they had these, these things happening in their lives that uh, just were sort of manifestations. And I believe there was alcoholism in Bob's family patterns as well. So he was also following some family patterns. Bob heard Earl Nightingale. And again, we could do a whole talk about Earl Nightingale, just an amazing man. Um, he had a radio show. He called it often the strangest secret. He learned that the ideas that thoughts and mind produce after their kind are very much a unity thought as well. And Bob started listening to, to Earl Nightingale after he quit the fire department. And as he listened to Earl Nightingale give sort of the positive ways of being in life and that you are in charge of yourself, you cannot look at the past as defining your future. Uh, he decided to also heal himself. He says he drove around in a sales job and he had a small battery opted record player and he would play Earl Nightingale's records in the car as he drove from one place to the next uh, to do his sales job after he was no, no longer a firefighter. So really interesting how they both sort of came through this time of realization from hearing from somebody else and then taking it into themselves and saying, wait a minute, I, I can do that. 
They both moved away from their, their home spaces. We know that Charles and Myrtle uh, were moved to several places actually, but ended up in Kansas City, Missouri. The West was opening. So it was kind of a big change of, of time in the 1860s and 70s. Uh, Bob moved to Wheeling, Illinois. That's actually where Conant Nightingale Company was. He actually called the people at Earl Nightingale's company and said, I like your stuff so much. I want to come in and learn more. And he went and worked for them um, at the time and actually sort of, again, said what he was taking as his learnings and putting them into more teachings. Um, I put the comment here that they both needed to start a movement. I think they're both very much introverted people. They would probably prefer not to be at the front of the stage. But in many ways, they were driven, driven to have more of a movement in their life. And we both they know they both wrote books. Uh, you Were Born Rich uh, uh, was Bob's mo most famous book, was on a New York, New York Times bestsellers list. And Myrtle wrote Healing Letters and How to Let God Help You. They both took their message to the world. Two very introverted people that could have just stayed broken, that decided to take on a new thought, if you will, and move into the action of putting it towards themselves first and then moving it out to the world. And Bob started a production company where he started to write books and, and encourage people to talk about these things, teach these things out loud, have seminars. Uh, one of his first ones was actually to an insurance company. And the idea was how could they get more sales? And Bob's idea was you never have to have anybody spend money. That's never the way to make sales. The way to make sales is be available tell people what they want to hear and do what you say you're going to do. And his comment to them was, get to work half an hour earlier, make five phone calls before 9 a.m. And of course the insurance company skyrocketed in sales. So everybody was happy, but he didn't tell them how to make money. He told them how to have a better attitude. Myrtle never talked about necessarily about having money or making money. He, she talked always about having a better attitude taking the prayers that you need to say and making sure you have your action. And just looking up uh, Myrtle Fillmore's death date, she died in 1931 at the age of 86. And isn't it interesting that Bob died this year in February at the age of 87. So they're within a year of each other of the longevity of their life as well. I mentioned in the chat at the earlier part that the songs we have at the Unity um, service today are all Bob's favorites. He loved older songs. He loved things that you know, perked him up and had really positive wording, which is always great. But he always said too, don't discount what's happening today with younger people. They're amazing. Bring them along. Take them in. Teach them new things. Allow them to have their music and their thoughts and their ideas. He was always very open. If you go to a Bob Proctor seminar, there's always lots of music in the break times making people happy and feeling excited, like a lot of our Unity songs do as well, which is kind of fun. We know from week one with Kelly, they were both healers. You know what was familiar becomes comfortable. And we all know that everything happens in growth in the outside of the comfort zone. There's actually a poem called The Comfort Zone. And it's talking about the fact that you can have everything you want. But if you're living inside a small box, you're always in the comfort zone. You don't ever have the growth. Growth should make you afraid. Bob always says, have a dream so big, it scares you. If the dream is too small and you can see all the steps, it's not a big enough dream yet. And he always wanted to move people towards where they are. You might notice that I have a little light bulb on each of the slides. You know, Thomas Edison talked about the fact that he invented the light bulb, but he actually, truly, he found 10,000 ways not to make a light bulb. That's really what it did is an experimentation. But the idea that when the light bulb was found, he had actually invented a whole bunch of things that we still use today as far as finding all of the other experimentation he did. So his mind was on one thing to move to that end goal, but in the middle, all the lessons along the way were actually worthwhile. Both Bob and Myrtle were very linear and analytical people. But they liked people. They weren't necessarily extroverts, but they liked people. They wanted to connect and they wanted to share ideas. They were very willing to be encouraging to people. And I've seen that in both the senses of them wanting to have people to be in better places. They both realize, and Bob will talk about the 12-step program. And a lot of you know of the 12-step program to do with AA and several of the anonymous groups. And one of the situations or the very first one is really that you have to let go and let spirit into your life. 
spirit becomes part of the, the co-creation of an abundant universe. But if you don't believe in something bigger than you, then you don't understand there's more moving us. We don't make gravity. We don't make electricity. We just found it and now know how it works. So we understand that. They also both knew that the past never defined them and to take chances, you try new things, but you don't always, always attach yourself to the outcome. The outcome might be very, very different than what you see. And I, I think I've told the story before when I was with Bob, the first facilitation I did with him, um, I cried and cried and cried. Everything he said seemed to, to, to just matter to me. And I was crying tears of happiness. I was crying tears of release, of releasing some of my past belief system that come from family and from upbringing and, you know, from, from not having enough sometimes and your parents saying you just have to manage with what you have and all that kind of stuff. And I just was so grateful to him for always saying, you know, take the chance to move forward. And he was a great thinker like that. One of Bob's sayings was, see yourself where you want to be and then be there. Don't be in the past. Be there. Act like the person you want to become. One of the things Bob would do in a talk, um, he'd have hundreds of people there sometimes, but somebody's talked to a smaller group. He'd take a big hourglass and he'd turn it upside down and he'd put it at the front of the stage. He wouldn't say anything about it. He'd just walk away and let it go. He'd talk for half an hour or so. And then he'd say, oh, see the bottom of the hourglass? See that sand? That's the past. The past never defines us. It's now gone. Don't dwell there. Don't live in that sand. Live in the sand at the top, going through the hourglass as your present and your future. And it was such a powerful way of thinking, a small thing. But how many people do we know that simply dwell in the past, which is always a place that's going to take us to either where we don't want to be or never move us forward or keep us stuck in something that we think is a belief system we have to have. And it does not have to be there. Both Myrtle and Bob were also teachers. And Kelly talked a lot about that on week two of her talks. Uh, she talked about Myrtle talked about facing fear and rewriting the narrative, which is a lot like the healing factor, facing what is already there and saying, wait a minute, is this actually true? Is there a truth to this that I have to take and understand? Or is this actually just something I've understood and is actually a non-truth? I mentioned before that Bob left school at grade 10, so he never went on to higher education in the sense of we see it as colleges and universities and one thing or another. He actually just said he was a life learner of all things living. And of course, he was a reader of 100 books after that and many, many things once he fixed his life to be in a positive and moving forward way. Myrtle was a bit of a rebel because she went to Oberlin College at a time where women did not go to higher education. In it's sort of almost opposite scenarios where in Myrtle's time, she would have probably been encouraged to quit school and become a lady of the house, get married, learn you know, household skills, that kind of idea. But she went on and actually did more. So they kind of had opposite educational factors in the sense of when, when they live, which is really interesting. They were both natural teachers. They uh, understood how to speak to people. They understood how to encourage people. They understood how to want others to shine. So even though they might have also taken uh, words that were powerful and made them uh, their own words and told them to other people, they also let others shine in a continuous way. They wanted others to be known and to let them come to the front of the stage. And we've seen that lots in unity where new thought leaders were taken in and moved through. And of course, we see that a lot with Bob Proctor. He has always had other people turn up and he's always allowed them to be at the front of the stage. We know from unity teachings that gratitude is always the answer, even if it's for the lessons learned along the way. The lessons learned along the way sometimes take us to stepping stones to other times that we think, gosh, if that hadn't happened, this wouldn't have happened. And how many times we've we been in a place where we think we're learning a really hard lesson and something really good but really different comes out of it. You know, you meet an entirely different set of people or you're on a career path that you don't even know is happening or something really wonderful happens to one of your children. Something where you're thinking, oh my gosh, this is really difficult, but have a, there's a breakthrough and you see the lessons for what it is and having gratitude all the way along. Bob says gratitude is an attitude that hooks us up to our source of supply. And the more grateful you are, the closer you become to your maker, to the architect of the universe, to the spiritual core of your being, 
it's a phenomenal lesson. And wouldn't that sound like something Myrtle or Charles could say? The exact same type of, of, of language that they use, hook up to the source of supply, you know, go to the core of your spiritual being, keep things as phenomenal lessons, don't get downtrodden, keep lifted up, do what we need to do. And it's so much fun when you can look back on things. I, really, I, I have a quick story that I, I uh, met a, a teacher of mine and she had a, a new baby and I offered to babysit when I was about 12 years old. Her husband was an, is, was an optometrist and I, be, I became their babysitter. And through the course of our lifetime together, I'm actually in her condo right now, 40, 40, no, 49 years later, I, she's still my best friend. Her husband, who was the optometrist, encouraged me to go into opticianry and called me one day, literally 20 years after we met each other and said, hey, the School of Optometry is looking for an optician. Do you think you'd like to apply? I was getting a divorce. I had a little tiny baby. I needed a life change. That's the kind of things you look back on and think, wow, what was the universe putting in place for me when I was 12 years old? And that's my teacher, if I could be her babysitter. So never discount the fact that many things are in motion all the time. And this is what both of these fine teachers tell us. Everything is in motion all the time. We don't know because we can't always see what's happening, but if we're always thinking and feeling, we're going in the right direction. Bob's Bible was the Napoleon Hill book, Think and Grow Rich. Uh, Napoleon Hill was uh, commissioned to write that book. He was to go to people that had done well, uh, the Rockefellers and the Carnegies of the, of the US uh, mogul groups and find out what they did and how they did that and what their mindset was. And Bob's holding that book in that picture that you can see there. He actually got a first edition copy and he actually, in every talk that Bob ever did, in every lesson he ever gave, every lecture he ever did, he held that book in his hand. He knew it off by heart. He would literally say, oh, on page 58, it says, but he wasn't reading the book. He knew it off by heart already. That was his Bible. He thought that the thinking patterns of the 1880s were a vortex of new thought. And this is a truth, actually. There was innovation. There was medical discoveries. There was discovery in world travel. Uh, the car was being invented. Electricity was being invented. Human life was changing. We were also starting to talk about things like psychiatry and psychology and human behavior. That hadn't really been talked about. You just did what you did. Sigmund Freud was born. People that came out to talk about things uh, mostly North America and the Europeans, but it, you know, it went all over the world, depending on who you were and where you were coming from. In Concord, Massachusetts, there was actually a vortex of thought that included Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau and uh, Mr. Alcott, who was the uh, father of Louisa May Alcott, who wrote Little Women, and he taught his four daughters how to live in new thought. These three and many others would get together in evenings and just talk about bigger ideas and be better, which was just awesome. There was a huge shift in life going on. One of the, the sayings I found that um, Napoleon Hill said, said, if you think you're beaten, you are. If you think you do not dare, you don't. If you like to win, but you think you can't, it's almost certain you won't. If you think you will lose, you've already lost. It's all a state of mind. You have to be sure of yourself before you ever win a prize. And the human who wins is the human who thinks they can. So he already had that thought. That book was actually published and finally published in 1937. And that was way before many of our times, but the idea was already out there. He was literally going to these people that already were successful in life. And the one thing he found about the most successful people was that they were happy because they also shared what they had. They gave things away. They encouraged other people. They lifted others up. Uh, Bob always talks about the pie and there's a pie and the pie has slices. And if I have more of the pie, you have less of the pie. And that's not true because Bob always said the pie gets bigger. And that was the most important lesson. The pie can always be bigger. You know, we see things like Rockefeller Center and Carnegie Hall in New York. Those were from those companies and those men who said, 
I need to give back to my community. And we still have those places now, which is amazing. They were also social justice activists. Myrtle said, if I speak the truth, but do not do the truth, I am silent. They all knew that you had to put feet to the prayers, as we kind of say. Their, income, their outcome was not based on some luck. It was based on the work they did. Uh, Kelly talked about the fact that um, Myrtle was not overly motherly. And I would say Bob was not overly fatherly. Um, he left his children behind for a while and went on seeking on his own mission for a bit. And <laughs> did, did what he had to do, which was totally fine. But in doing that, he regrouped himself and went back to his children later and, and made amends with them. And they'd had a nice life through the rest of his life. We talked about them both being linear and analytical, but they were always in support as support to humanity. They, they, they enjoyed hearing from other people. They encouraged people. They, uh, uh, Kelly talked about uh, Myrtle always answering letters saying, thank you so much for writing. It's a pleasure to hear from you. I'm so glad you shared, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But she did not, as well as Bob, suffer anybody to give them excuses. So once there was some advice done, or any sort of teaching that was, was lived, it was like, what are you doing about this? So no excuses meant in life. They support and they both believed in giving back. I can remember uh, in Toronto, uh, Bob had a, a big conference, there's about 10,000 people. And he brought a, a woman on stage named Cynthia Kersey and she had started the Unstoppable Foundation. And that was to do with Habitat for Humanity. And it has turned out to be a huge thing now, but she was just beginning it at the time. And she was, anyway, he made her the keynote speaker. He paid her to be the keynote speaker. Even she was gonna talk about her journey about how she made this foundation. It was just starting. He gave everybody in the audience the opportunity to donate to her foundation. And he said, hey, you know, if you've got 10 bucks, let's make it 10 bucks. That's to, you know, $100,000 if we all give 10 bucks, right? But if we all gave $100, that's a million dollars. So he was just offering the idea if everybody gives something, this foundation could get off the ground and be supported. And it was a totally wonderful situation. And she's gone on to do huge things around the world, which has been totally awesome. Bob says, nothing is more powerful than a positive thought joined with positive action. Again, Bob speaking unity language, the feet to our prayers. Action is the real measure of intelligence. I just have to refer quickly back to, to what Jonah was saying at the beginning when we were getting together, the um, hurricanes in Barry, the Barry area. In 1985, my in-laws were in Barry and there was a hurricane that year too, just a few weeks before I got married actually. It came through Barry and there was a man on a radio station that said, I want to raise $3 million for hurricane relief three days from now in three hours of time. And everybody said, oh, no, no, it won't happen. It won't happen. In that time, he gathered people at a table and he said, brainstorm. I just want everybody to brainstorm. I want the word no to not be at this table. Everything's yes and, yes and, yes and. And that all happened. CTV came up. CBC came up. Global came up. It went across the country three days later for a three hour time. And he didn't raise $3 million. He raised $10 million for hurricane relief. So the idea of positive thinking, not letting no get in the way. How many times do we say no to things? So pay attention to not saying no. I like this quote, I'm gonna end with this. Fear and faith both demand you believe in something that you cannot see. You choose. And if you're choosing one or the other, my guess is you already know what you're going to be choosing. I'm going to end and uh, just take one little paragraph out of the meditation I did write. Thank you, thank you, thank you to both Cheryl's for covering the situation <laughs> at the end. And thank you to uh, Cheryl Driscoll for doing that wonderful meditation. I'm so, so grateful. That was so nice of you to fill that time. But I just wanted to mention and close with this. Wallace Waddles in 1912 wrote a book called The Science of Getting Rich. It's a facilitated program through Bob Proctor and I'm one of the facilitators and I love that program, it's wonderful. But here's what he said. Everything had to be created twice, once in our mind and once into reality. There is a thinking stuff, he said, from which all things are made and which in its original state permeates, penetrates and fills the interspaces of the universe. A thought in this substance produces the thing that is imagined by this thought. A person conforms things in their thought 
and by impressing their thought upon formless substance can cause the thing that they think about to be created. So always use the formless substance for the highest good. And with that, I'll say namaste and thank you. <laughs>